Gabriella Coleman. She's um, an anthropologist, and she's famously known for her work on um, the Davian Linux community and the hacker group Anonymous. Um, so, what is my purpose here? You know, I ask that all the time. It's like a bunch of these like techies here, and I have to learn the lingo, and nothing makes sense, and the humor makes no sense. So, <laughs> it's a process, right? Um, so, um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bridge the gap between the social science, academia, and blockchain, uh, because I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other. Um, so tech people think that uh, social science is useless and that it's not a real science. I get it. Okay, I get it. Um, but on the other hand, social science academics critique blockchain as a hyper-libertarian technology that's supported by a bunch of technocrats. And I know that's not necessarily true. But, um, so yeah, I want to know how can we proceed forward so that there is greater mutual understanding between us and can we huddle each other's hands and build together? I'm sorry if that made you cringe, but um, yeah. I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning. So uh, the story of how I got into blockchain is actually a pretty interesting one. Um, so my partner is in the blockchain industry and uh, basically he got invited to an IC3 bootcamp uh, at Cornell University and um, not knowing really much about blockchain at the time, I decided to tag along, see what it was all about. Of course, I've encountered a lot of these like hyped up media articles on blockchain, so I wanted to find out for myself what it was about by you know talking to like really prominent people there. Um, so yeah, so I went there, and there was like this excursion, uh, which was like a hike with Vitalik and. There I was, just like hiking with him and asking him all these questions like, what do you think about Ethereum? What's your vision? Um, embarrassingly enough, okay, I will admit, I did not know who he was at the time. <laughs> and only now, I'm like, whoa. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I, I was very inspired and basically I wanted to know more about this very unique community um, and that's really what got me to embark on this research. So before I knew about the cultural dynamics of Ethereum, I just assumed like many high-tech, like Silicon Valley communities, you know, it was like super techno-utopian, the rainbows and unicorns certainly didn't help that. And just like, so we're on the same page, do techno-utopian is basically um, an ideology that's encountered in technological communities, that's premised on the belief that advances in technology could bring about a perfect society or help fulfill utopian ideals in the near future. So, before really going into the community, I started observing how the general public perceives blockchain. Um, so, some of my general observations were like, people outside of crypto and blockchain spaces think it's a hyper-libertarian technology, uh, you know, it's just a bunch of like right wing libertarians um, that are running it, and um, there was actually a conference in Montreal this year that I went to, it was the IETF conference, which is the Internet Engineering Task Force, these are the guys that established standards uh, for the internet, and it was really interesting how nobody spoke about blockchain there, nobody mentioned anything, um, and I talked to some prominent people um, and asked them, like, what do you think of blockchain? And they just tended to avoid that whole discussion. And I was like, what is going on here? Um, but then um, going into more depth on these discussions, they said, oh, you know, well, blockchain is just like a bunch of these people who are just trying to uh, solve every human problem with, uh, you know, this technology, and it's just a huge sham. Um, and then it's really not better in the social academia. They think it's like a hyper-libertarian technology with this techno-colonial twist. And of course there's the general public that assumes that it's a hype or just something that supports criminal activity based on their knowledge of Bitcoin. So, going into this research, I had two goals in mind. So the first one, I wanted to know what are some of the ideologies that exist in Ethereum? And secondly, I wanted to know to what extent does techno-utopianism prevail in the community narratives? And this led me to draw two findings. 
So basically, I found that Ethereum accommodates developers and other actors with distinct political motives of perspectives, right? You have left anarchists and right libertarians and everything in between. And secondly, developers are not really techno-utopian, to my surprise. So I was really interested in how there's like this plethora of diverse ideologies in Ethereum. And I really wanted to unpack that. Like, I wanted to know what was behind this phenomenon. Um, and this led me to draw two more conclusions, which basically have to do with the design of the protocol and um, the philosophy of decentralization. So, the design of the protocol. So, part of the reason why there's diverse ideologies in Ethereum is based on how Ethereum is actually designed, right? So, artifacts actually have politics. Um, and there is a theorist named uh, Langdon Winner who put forward this theory that all technology is, in fact, political. So, this means that all technological artifacts in their design, they have political properties and that they can have an impact on the ways that they enact social ordering. So, he uses the example of bridges. Uh, that were built over, over parkways on Long Island in the 1920s. And they were built in such a way to discourage buses um, um, from like entering them, which resulted in limiting the access of racial minorities and low-income groups who used these buses to get to a popular beach in New York at that time. So this means that technological design enforces a specific political agenda. And in the case of bridges, it was a racist agenda. And to this day, even though our attitudes towards racism have somewhat improved, the bridges still continue to stand there and enforce these dynamics. So this inherently means that specific design choices can affect how power is distributed, and that certain technologies are compatible with some form of organization than others. So the best example is nuclear energy, right? That requires highly centralized um, and authoritarian forms of organization <coughs> in order to be operated. So what this really says is that we need to consider the relationship between technological design and its material outcomes. And this really got me thinking about Bitcoin and Ethereum and how we can apply this theory to uh, these two protocols. So like Bitcoin is a fairly, it's a fairly restricted protocol it uh, you know, has a limited language script, um, and it's mostly just a cash protocol. Whereas Ethereum, you know, it's based on a Turing complete uh, language, Solidity or Viper, and it has unlimited potential. So it allows people in, in this industry to basically encode their values. Um, and it allows for this diversity to happen. Um, whereas Bitcoin, it's more secure, and there's less room to experiment with it. So therefore, you're only getting like not as diverse of values as like in Ethereum. Um, so that's that. Um, and then secondly, second reason why there's diverse perspectives in Ethereum is because of the philosophy of decentralization itself. However, um, to be honest with you, like I don't know what decentralization is. Uh, I don't think there's a clear-cut definition for it. Um, and actually, decentralization has long been central to economic and political philosophy, but has only recently become a core technical imaginary. So just so we're clear, it wasn't the technology that emerged, it wasn't decentralized technology, but uh, actually political philosophy that later on seeped into the technical fields. So something interesting about uh, the philosophy of decentralization is that it can accommodate people with different perspectives and ideologies to imagine themselves as part of a common project. And we can conceptualize decentralization as something in social science we call a boundary object, which is a theoretical term that signifies how a concept or an actual object allows for actors from distinct political um, aspirations to cooperate on a project despite having different and sometimes even conflicting interests. And um, this has been a defining feature of open source communities. And likewise, Ethereum, which accommodates developers 
with various political motives, um, from left-leaning anti-capitalist agitators to capitalist-friendly uh, libertarians. But the thing is, is that everyone has their own idea about what decentralization is. Um, and that, of course, could be a good thing, but, uh, you know, because it allows for collaboration and to work efficiently, but at the same time, um, this lack of the terms of specificity also can obscure um, centralization, and I will speak more about that in the next slides to come. So I'm going to continue on with the research goals. Um, so, so I covered the first one, and the second research goal I had in mind is to what extent does techno-utopianism prevail in the community narratives of Ethereum? And the result was not techno-utopia. It's shocking, right? Um, and these are some of the quotes I received that I pulled from my interviews. The crypto hype is just a blind leading the blind. We see the challenges that face us, which means that being optimistic isn't always easy. Most of us are not here to make a profit, but are here for the intellectual challenge and curiosity. Making vast statements does a lot of disservice to the technology and others along the similar lines. So then, this got me thinking, where is the hype? Oh, sorry, before that, this led me to draw the conclusion that, in fact, Ethereum developers are very pragmatic, level-headed, and reflexive of their privilege and technocratic status. At least the ones that I've spoken to. Um, <laughs> I can't speak for all, but... Um, so, where is this hype really coming from? So blockchain's public reputation is now hyper-libertarian, and perhaps this is for a good reason. Its uptake has been largely in capitalistic orders. So this hype is essentially being used as a marketing tool, you know, like in ICOs and whatnot. Um, and it's being used by profit-driven entrepreneurs, extreme right-wing libertarians, and technology fetishists. And since blockchain is in its nascency, um, these stories are needed. Um, I, I get it. Like you sort of need the hype in order to fill in some of the uncertainties that currently exist in relation to blockchain. And um, the only problem, however, is that these um, capitalist venture people are the ones who are basically influencing the narratives of blockchain, and they're basically shaping public perception of blockchain. So, what does this all mean? So I've just bombarded you with like a bunch of information, and uh, yeah. So this is this is where I want to talk about how my two uh, research questions start to fuse into each other. So diverse perspectives of Ethereum in Ethereum does not necessarily represent um, all of the perspectives in how the public uh, perceives blockchain. So. Ethereum allows for diverse ideologies to exist in the space and make collaboration possible, both through design and the philosophy of decentralization. However, this does not mean that people who enter into this network are equal. And some have greater resources and skills, which can result in recentralization. And this can be seen in the Bitcoin network, for example. Um, so there are certain factors, such as early adoption, wealth and external economy, and access to, um, let's say, low-cost electricity for mining, which can create um, concentration. Yet, when we call this technology decentralized, um, it just diverts attention from factors that could potentially lead to some degree of centralization. So, really, it's the people with resources, uh, like the venture capitalists, who are determining a lot of the public discourse on blockchain. <coughs> And this is one of the reasons why the public continues to perceive it as a hype and this right-wing libertarian technology. So I think what we really have to think about is finding a way of defining centralization. Uh, because I say the term is really risky, and, and this is because oftentimes when something gets decentralized, it can cause new forms of centralization to emerge somewhere else in the system. And this is something that has not only been found in tech, 
but actually a pattern noticed by political science in studying um, government institutions. Yet, we continue to use the term of decentralization and it obscures certain areas of centralization. And we've seen this even in mining pools, right? They're the perfect example. So, I say, don't expect any system to be fully decentralized. Instead, it might be more helpful to be more clear about what the particular features of a system, a given design, seeks to decentralize. And decentralizing mediations cannot expect to get rid of every centralizing uh, influence in the outside world. It's just not realistic. And this means that while technology that is meant to decentralize can introduce new possibilities, which of course can be liberating, it can also invite more unfavorable conditions such as unaccountable concentration of power because it always goes both ways. Therefore, at the end of the day, it's not really about caring whether something is decentralized or centralized. Um, what we should be asking is whether the thing we are building is accountable. Uh, meaning that if we should be, meaning that um, if perhaps, like let's say we're not meeting the needs of users, there is room to change that. Or if we're not meeting the needs of minorities, we can still change that. Um, it doesn't make sense to pursue decentralization at the expense of everything else if that means that, uh, you know, at the end of the day we're just creating um, outcomes that run the risk of enabling unaccount unaccountable concentration of power. So, going forward, I have two propositions for Ethereum. Um, so I propose we stop using the blockchain as a solution narrative and instead focus on using the blockchain as an alternative method. And the reason why is because blockchain is precisely empowering right now because it's the underdog. It introduces diversity into the existing systems, allowing people to have more options. For certain people in the space though, um, they see it as like the means to it. And I think when it's envisioned as replaceable and superior to um, every traditional institution, that's kind of like, if it's amplified to the extreme, that's when um, it begins to take on a slightly dystopian term. And uh, it takes on like this libertarian narrative, which is fairly extreme. And I, I don't think that's where we want to be going. And the other recommendation I have is to start building networks, um, it, you know, with other with other industries and in other fields. So, for example, like IETF, uh, maybe academic ones. Um, and it's funny because, like, no matter where I am in the world, I always see the same people. And I mean, it's great and all because it's a community, but at the same time, it also becomes a closed circuit. And I think what we really have to strive for is interdisciplinarity because that is basically what is going to challenge us and make us step outside of ourselves and make us question, like, why are we doing X and not Y, right? It's going to give us a broader perspective to, some sol to solve some of the challenges that perhaps we're not seeing because we're, like, in our own headspace. Um, so, yeah, um, that's basically what I have for today. Um, thank you so much for listening. Um, if you'd like to debate or chat with me on any of the points today, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, I love to argue. So, thank you so much. This is my Twitter. Yeah.